Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce, oh, sorry, um, welcome you all to our Arts Heritage Community Dialogue, being hosted by Axoni and Join Her Network. Um, I would like to introduce our main speaker for the evening, um, Professor Chikowero. Unfortunately, our second speaker was unable to um, join us this evening due to some technical difficulties. Um, our speakers, as we are, are placed all over the world, so we have to be flexible and work with each other in order to make the work. However, Axoni and Join Her Network have not made a false will bring you Professor Saki Mafundikwa at another um, at another date to be determined in the future. So without any further delay, we would like to welcome Dr. Mo uh, Professor Mose Chikowero to enlighten us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Anyat. Namaswanda. Manlovu. Uh, and others of our listeners uh, who are here. Uh, thank you, Asconi. Uh, join her um, for hosting me. Uh, again, um, I was a little saddened that um, uh, the esteemed colleague of mine, uh, Professor Mafundikwa, was not able to join us because we had framed this to be a dialogue uh, in many ways. Uh, and so his unanticipated absence has uh, changed the framing of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, not, not too much, a little bit. Uh, I left to ad adjust what it is that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, to cover some aspects that um, Ngara was going to cover in, uh, in his contribution. Uh, but again, nonetheless, this is not a major uh, uh, issue. As I know, Ngara will be here and we can, I, I'll join him uh, for this conversation. I'd like to share my screen. Okay. Uh, I was playing Bavarira the song that you see there. But that's not what I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share some slides. This is what uh, I want to share. Also, I'm trying to minimize uh, us so that you can see the screen. I can also see my own screen. Right, so, my talk today is going to revolve around uh, what I conceptualize is a uh, state of disarmament, uh, which is a reading of state making in African recent history. I'll define these terms uh, maybe now and as I go. Um, I was holding a copy of my book uh, earlier before we started I have, uh, this copy on here. You can, you can hear the sonics. 
maybe you don't you can't see it now. Uh, so this book uh, is pub was published in 2015. Uh, the title of that book is African Music, Power and Being in Colonial Zimbabwe, published by Indiana Invest Press. It is a book that uh, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my friends, uh, many people understand as a book on uh, African in Zimbabwe and Southern African uh, musical cultures. It's true, but that's uh, the first reading. Yeah, I don't want to say superficial, because well, that reading is correct, but there's a deeper reading. Uh, it's uh, to me, what I was attempting to do with that book, it was to diagnose our states of being. Uh, so that the musical cultures and arts are just uh, a vista. It's a window to look into these states of being, which are basically are states of disarmament. Uh, when I say disarmament, if you think in military terms, this is really um, uh, the removal of that which protects the protective armor. And in this work, in a lot of my work, this book and others that I'll talk about maybe briefly, uh, this disarmament is cultural first and foremost. Uh, when you think about things like colonization, we really tend to think about the military conquests and occupation and subjugation. But what I'm arguing in my work uh, starting with this foundational book, is that uh, conquest and military subjugation are important, but they are not the most important um, uh, weapons and uh, instruments of um, uh, oppression and subjugation. Uh, the first and foremost is the cultural uh, dimension of things. Because once you've uh, stormed the fortresses, the cultural fortresses of a people, it becomes very, very difficult for those people to remain themselves, uh, to resist in any consistent way, in any unified way, in any conscious way, because cultural conquest hits at the core of the consciousness of people's self-understanding. So this is, uh, um, in many ways, uh, the core of the argument that I make in this book. And in subsequent books, um, in subsequent books, I do grapple with this problem of uh, us as an African people, doesn't matter where, uh, have been subjugated uh, in this way, we have been disarmed. So that is the problem. That's the diagnosis of the problem. Uh, then you should look for solutions with a full understanding of that uh, situation. So my uh, second book that is upcoming is called Chimurenga Afrosonic Making of Zimbabwe, the Military Entertainment Complex. I also uh, research and write about uh, tools and technologies of colonization and self-liberation, such as radio broadcasting, which was used as, uh, uh, as a tool to re-engineer our minds, uh, to re-engineer our sensorium as a people, to determine and change uh, uh, what, what, what we tell each other uh, about the world our knowledge systems, what we think we understand and what we hear. Uh, all that is very, very important. Uh, we take radio for granted uh, these days, but uh, this is a work that talks about how radio cam is that one of those uh, insidious uh, weaponries. Uh, then my um, most important uh, latter work that's ongoing, is on the Zimbabwean and Southern African and broadly African wars of self-liberation uh, since the 1960s. But also a work that has been uh, in progress for a long time. 
uh, titled for now, Mchuchete Wachua Shira, an inspired autobiography of my great ancestor chief. Uh, I was playing that song at the beginning in Bavarira, uh, the song of Chuashira, Chuashira's song. It's a song that is played whenever um, uh, my people, chiefs in my in my um, uh, clan are being uh, enthroned. So it is a deeply uh, historical song uh, that's associated mainly with Mchuchete uh, Wachuashira. Uh, but I'll circle back a bit more uh, to frame the problem uh that really we should we should really see as uh as as, as an opening uh to what i call the post-colonial uh, psychosonic disorders uh, as our main or indicator of our state of being and so i often uh like to start the story with uh this image here uh of um the young girl Rutendo Nadile uh, Nyoni uh, was a high school student when I met her in 2014 in Harare. You can see she's dressed in school uniform. Uh, so two things are important there and in that image. She's dressed in school uniform and she's holding Mbira, uh, which is the epitome of our Zimbabwean an African uh, metallurgical and uh, sonic engineering. More than a thousand years uh, old, invented by our ancestors. Um, and she, I was holding that instrument. And uh, she asked me when, she, when I met her, uh, if I taught that instrument, I said, well, I don't teach it. Uh, I'm also kind of learning, uh, but um, I basically play with it. Well, Tendo told me a story, uh, how your mother smashed her own instrument because she used to own one. And so she was really burning inside uh, to acquire a different one and keep it safely and away from her mother who would still destroy it. But she was uh, adamant. Uh, that she would never stop playing the instrument uh, that her ancestors made centuries ago. So the two things uh, for me here to understand the African condition, uh, the African cultures, but also the place of the school uh, brought out in this image. And I'll be talking about uh, these two things uh, at, some, at some level uh, today. Uh, but uh, I also opened the book with this passage, um, yeah, that's on, that's on the screen. And I'll read uh, uh, the first paragraph. So writing about a childhood in 1960s Buera, in rural colonial Zimbabwe, Sekai Nzenza in the middle there, reminisced about how one Christmas Eve, the mother instructed her and her siblings to look out for a local Anglican priest, Babam Temarari. Once they spotted him coming, she instructed them to hide everything that was unchristian around the village compound. We covered two big pots of the highly potent manga beer under sacks and blankets, then closed the kitchen hut. My brother Charles dragged our famous drum in Goma called Zino Irema and hid that in the granary. My father reluctantly switched off his Mahlatini in the Mautela Queen's music and hit the gramophone in the bedroom. In many ways, this is also the, um, uh, the epitome of uh, what I'm talking about here, the cultural disarmament and internalization of the cultures that came to criminalize, to demonize, uh, and to confuse and bewilder uh, the African. Uh, another story, another, another anecdote um, is, I'm, I'm sure some of you um, remember when PJ, Peter Jones died in, on April 27th in 2020. And one of these reports on his death um, was a, some kind of a biographical attack on his significance. And so one journalist wrote that more often than not, 
PJ would connect Zimbabwe to the world, playing latest music as it happens on Billboard, UK Top 40, and what have you. During those days, it was rare to get latest music, and many would see PJ collecting his bag of latest hits at the airport. The airport. What is an airport in our cultural uh, imaginary, in our place in the world, and in our uh, cultural sensorium? Something to reflect on. However, his critics were quick to blame PJ for focusing more on foreign music than local. But whichever way you look at it, the history of Zimbabwean radio would not be complete without mentioning PJ, your DJ. A story that you can spend the whole day talking about, but I just wanted to put it up there and uh, hopefully have conversations about that. So all these stories and others that populate this book, uh, try to diagnose uh, what I conceptualize as the Shurama Tongo as a condition of African uh, ruination. Uh, Shurama Tongo is what Walter Rodney called underdevelopment. Uh, and it defines underdevelopment uh, as a state of being that does not mean the absence of development, but a regressive product of plunder, enslavement, colonialism, neocolonialism, and extroversion. Now, this uh, uh, this this state state of uh, uh, of being uh, when you are living like. Uh, where you are does not belong to you, that space. You're always, you're always uh, uh, living with a, with a glance over your shoulder. Is if somebody's gonna come and repossess uh, that space uh, where you are, that's extroversion. And you're also looking sideways to receive and to take, to assimilate, to open the door, to open the mind to things that come to destabilize your world and redefine it uh, for you. Uh, writing about uh, something similar, um, Mainawa Kinyati in his book, History of Resistance in Kenya, uh, tells us that after the British takeover, colonialism itself, not nature, frustrated our further development as a people. This is very, very important because, I mean, uh, the idea of development is so intoxicating. Uh, there are programs in universities and schools and uh, there are NGOs and think tanks and, well, think tanks, but more tank than think, if you really think about it, which uh, deal with the idea of development, sponsor the idea of development, Sp sponsor what they call development, but is it actually development? Uh, there is something that's deeper than when we talk about development, we tend to think about uh, the macroeconomics of things. Uh, but here, uh, again, with Walter Rodney, I'm very much interested in something that underlies and uh, subverts all our efforts to do what we think uh, we, are, we are doing when you say development, uh, which is psychological underdevelopment. And Rodney wrote that any diagnosis of underdevelopment in Africa will reveal not just low per capita income and protein deficiencies, but also the gentlemen who dance in Abidjan, Accra, and in Kinshasa, when music is played in Paris, London, and New York. This is the cultural uh, fortress that's been destroyed. You can uh, think about the cultural impoverishment, the poverty of our artists, when millions are drained, when we dance to uh, other people's music, musics but our own, we are basically draining uh, the wealth uh, that would, should belong uh, to us culturally. If you look at uh, those people who sponsor the idea of development as something that comes from outside, uh, people like John Eilif, 
a professor of uh, African history at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, he tells us that poverty was an aboriginal condition in Africa, a structural primordial existence. And colonialism came to cure that. Colonialism is a good thing that came to, to solve the problem of development and poverty in Africa. He goes on to tell us that uh, Africa's splendor lies in its suffering. The heroism in African history is found not in the deeds of kings, but in the struggles of ordinary people against the forces of nature and the corrupt of men. And he says, likewise, the most noble European activities in Africa have been those often now forgotten, who have cared for the sick and starving and homeless. This is a European uh, teacher of African history, telling us that colonization and colonialism are good things. This is an example of what uh, Professor uh, Paul Tiambe Zeleza in his book, The Manufacturing of African Studies and Crisis Calls the Nine Lives of Imperialist Historiography. Scholarship is not just uh, um, fun. It is not uh, harmless. It is not just uh, pointless uh, writing, uh, you know. It, it is really the foundation for policy. And these are people who are contracted by policymakers, by NGOs, by think tanks, by governments uh, to advise policies for the African continent for, for African people who write like this. This is the colonial library. This is the global library. This book you find everywhere, read by African students. What are they being taught? Right. Uh, my, my reading of the African uh, condition, the psychological underdevelopment, uh, demystifies what uh, Alif and others try to, to lie to us as the causes of African uh, uh, poverty or impoverishment. So in a lot of my work, I read uh, what missionaries were doing. The activities of those people who supposedly cared for the sick and starving and homeless. These are the activities of Europeans. Uh, were they actually doing that? If you read um, writings by missionaries like this newspaper, I don't know if you uh, are aware that uh, there was a newspaper uh, like this one called the Kefa Express. As we all know, uh, Kefa is the N word. Uh, in Southern Africa and on the continent. These are missionaries writing in 1871, Europeans coming to Africa to do what? My argument to subvert uh, Africans in African, through African cultures. So this is uh, missionaries basically producing blueprints of African impoverishment in other words. And this is one guy who wrote, um, that uh, there was something called the native uh, department or native affairs department, which was the colonial uh, department in um, uh, most countries on the continent that was uh, mandated to deal with Africans and deal in its all senses. And uh, before the native department was even established in 1871, this guy was writing to the missionary run a newspaper published at Lovedale Mission Station in South Africa, that we must establish a native department. And to do what? And he says, this guy is called himself, uh, signed off as a colonist. The native department assisted by missionaries is decidedly the only safe stepping stone for us in dealing with the natives. Otherwise, all our efforts in dealing with the present objectionable native customs and amusements will recoil upon us. Okay, why did African cultures offend them? That's one of the key questions. A colonist goes on, it is evident that we must secure the services of missionaries and you must allow them to some extent to take the lead. By their teaching and influence, the kefir must be kindly and gradually won. 
from barbarism and hedonism to civilization and Christianity. And when he has reached this latter stage, then the Kepha himself will only too gladly and willingly seek to be subject to the same laws and the regulations which govern a civilized community. In other words, what a colonist is saying, Africans will only be too happy to be ruled by the white men, to be a subject of alien governance. Once we have stormed his cultural fortress, once we have removed his, his customs, uh, what it is that um, uh, he amuses himself with, um, his, his, his regions, uh, his spiritualities, then, then he's ours. So a few decades, uh, like 20 years after this uh, letter, we have exactly what a colonist is suggesting here uh, in, in Zimbabwe, what becomes Southern Rhodesia, maybe a decade uh, in South Africa. And uh, Europeans knew what they were doing. Uh, this is uh, the butcher of the Congo, uh, Leopold II, who killed more than 10 million Africans in his civilizing mission. Uh, these folks were deploying, they were deploying the church. Uh, and in, in this letter that he wrote to the missionaries in Belgium in 1883, he is basically um, uh, doing the very same thing uh, that people like colonists are doing in, uh, from, from love there, that we must uh, take away and destroy African cultures. We must destroy those cultures that prevent us from conquering them. Uh, that spirituality, which is a threat to our conquest, we must remove. So go and demonize. Make, um, and I'm quoting here, by all means, the Negro must be made Christian. By only this way will they let go of their rich culture and everything they respect about themselves. You can see that uh, Europeans uh, foregrounding the work of missionaries were basically re-engineering Africans and producing the kind of African that in many ways we have become over the, over the decades. You see that um, in the writings of uh, regular uh, Europeans, missionaries, but also soldiers in the colonial uh, wars of conquest, this is uh, Baden Power, Robert Baden Power, uh, who wrote um, in his book, The Matabele Campaign, that even when the present force, uh, Baden Power was a colonial soldier in the Matopo, uh, Matomboko, in Western Zimbabwe, where he was killing people, targeting uh, uh, spirit mediums uh, for, for Rod's BSA company. So and he wrote his mother, he was writing his mother in England. Even when the present force has broken up the impies in the field and cleared their strongholds out, there will remain a tale of work for local police to, to do in carrying out disarmament. So the European colonizer was interested in disarming Africans mili mil militarily, but also culturally and spiritually is Baden Powell understood. The doses being given, though better now, they are better then. When is then? In the future. The gratuitous violence seems the only way to get these men to understand there's a greater power than the Yamlimo. And once the lesson has been unmistakably brought home to them, there's some hope that a time of peace and permanence may dawn for them two-pronged process of state-making. What is state-making? We tend to think about a state uh, in the sense of a governing uh, uh, structure, uh, you know, making up a country. But I'm talking about the mind here. Uh, to make a state is to produce subjects of power. This is Africans were being produced into subjects of uh, the colonial uh, system. 
through military and cultural re-engineering. This is Baden Powell again. I'm sure many of you have seen this photograph during the rounds on the internet. This is a Baden Powell sketch in his notebook, which he called the Christmas tree. And this is how Christmas came to Africans. Uh, we are in October, uh, Christmas is coming. Many Africans are preparing for Christmas now. You see a Christmas tree in their homes. To Baden Powell, this is what it means. And today, if you really look at what we call Christmas, it's the same thing. Uh, I'm not inventing anything here. Baden Powell wrote all these things, including in his book, uh, the early campaigns, the Matabele campaign, 1896, and the downfall of Prembe in West Africa, a diary of life with the native levy in Ashanti, 1895 to 1896. Uh, I don't know how many of us know that um, as Baden Powell was destroying shrines and killing spirit mediums, he was also taking African uh, cultural artifacts, such as nons or enyika, that uh, uh, walking stick, if you want, uh, the scepter that uh, Mukwati used, uh, one of the prime spirit mediums in the Zimbabwean resistance. He took it to England and it was only retained in 1997, recovered from uh, Baden Powell's grandson by spirit medium Matosi. It is in Harare today. And Baden Powell lies buried in Nyeri. I saw his grave, I walked on his grave um, last uh, August. So there was a deep understanding of what um, uh, the colonial state was doing and working with the missionaries. Today we get uh, the, you know, the, the easy stat statistics that 40% uh, or if you, want, if you want, I mean, all the way to 80% of Africans are Christians. How did Africans become Christian? And what does it actually mean to be Christian as an African? This is uh, Cecil John Rhodes writing in 1898. This class, I think, is better than policemen and cheaper. This class, the missionaries. Missionaries as mercenaries of empire. This is why, even today in Zimbabwe, after the land reclamation of 2000, the church owns thousands of hectares of land today that John Rhodes gave to them as part of this mission to go destroy the native, deploying the church in the midst of Africans. And today, where does Rhodes lie buried? At the core of African spirituality and cosmology, right there at Matombo in Western Zimbabwe, where Baden Powell was destroying our shrines. So what is happening here is a spiritual conquest and the defilement, the mortuary defilement of African sacred species and, and, uh, and um, uh, um, epistines. There is a place where, where, where it's buried uh, basically is, um, if you look at the map of the tourism authority in Zimbabwe, it's called uh, the world's view. It's supposed to be a tourist uh, uh, space. What's the difference between tourism and terrorism? Again, I'm not inventing this. This is uh, uh, artwork that these guys sketched of themselves. This the American mercenary Frederick Burnham and the Baden Powell, the same one as they tracked and murdered African spirit mediums in Matombo to clear the project of military and spiritual disarmament. So the key uh, agenda behind uh, destroying African uh, sacred sites 
was written to prevent African self-reproduction in their own image, according to their own worldviews. What is an image? So do you, when you take a photograph of yourself, do you see somebody else uh, when you print that uh, photo? You see yourself, you have reproduced yourself. So in terms of living uh, self-reproduction, uh, you're supposed to continue in perpetuity as a people. But the missionary project and the colonial project was about undermining and cutting that process, which is why uh, these missionaries and the colonial system also targeted uh, the African living species and self-reproduction species, such as uh, the cooking species, what you call the kitchen today. This is one uh, missionary writing in 1893 in the very same Cafe Express. All around them was the great mass of hedonism. The air was full of hidden songs and sounds and the vision of hidden sights and customs. The environments were entirely hostile to the growth of the Christian character. The fathers and mothers did not know how to save their children from the contamination of their surroundings. A worker in the slums of London says, you cannot raise angels in pigsties. So this is the African home. Uh, hopefully at the end, I uh, will be able to talk about how uh, a lot of our uh, cultural workers have been able to read and uh, redeploy these spaces uh, for African uh, rearmament, including in the diaspora. But we have got to understand uh, the destruction or the, the destructive design first. And I took this image here. Um, in a 2014 uh, National Gallery of Zimbabwe exhibition uh, by my colleague who is not here, uh, Sakima Fundiko. The kitchen was uh, a space for gendered socialization. It was a space of birth and the life rituals. It was a shrine for death and afterlife rituals. That's why we hold Bira ceremonies in there to call the ancestors into the home. This is where naming ceremonies are conducted. This is where children, after soon after they are born, they are cooked. They are washed in herbs to fortify them against the evils of the world, to give them an, an identity. When they fall sick, they are treated in that space. They eat healthy cultural food in that space. It's the space of the ancestors. When they die, they spend a night lying instead on the Rukuwa behind where we were standing there. And from Rukuwa, they, they go to be buried in the Guva, straight to the grave from the shrine to the grave. The, gra the grave itself becomes a shrine. It's an extension of the African socialization space and sacred space. These are the spaces that missionaries in the colonial state were demonizing to subvert African self-reproduction. This was the school also. Uh, I'll read this passage that uh, I often read again, to illustrate the depth of the demonization. This is one missionary going to Zambia. Uh, and he wrote this in the Zambezi mission record, the Jesuit uh, publication that was run from Chishawasha mission is 1915. I was camped for the night within half a mile of a large native crow. It was in the middle of the rainy season. That year, the rains were far below the average and a dance was held that night to propitiate the evil spirits that were causing the drought. I don't know if the drought here in California is caused by evil spirits. The dance started at sunset and lasted till sunrise with continuous accompaniment of tom-toms. What things are called is important. What are tom-toms? The night was sultry 
and sleep was fitful. Wherever I, I walk, I could hear the unceasing sounding of the drum. The yelling and stamping was always going on with the same vigor. There was one voice that could be clearly distinguished from the others. I heard it at practically every hour between sunset and sunrise. I was told the drama is generally a specialist and that the same performer goes on from the beginning to the end of the dance. A rough estimate gave for that night well over half a million beats of the tom-tom. This guy was supposedly counting the number of beats on the Ngoma. And as he wrote uh, um, later on, don't ask them to, but don't ask them to do your work, how lazy they are. So all this was wasted energy that the colonial state and missionaries must harness. For what purpose? For colonial profit. Missionaries attacked the heart of the Zimbabwe civilization and spirituality, just as they attacked the African homes, uh, spaces of self-reproduction. At this very same time, as Professor Shadrick Chirikure uh, uh, illustrates in his book on Great Zimbabwe, colonial historians were trying to steal these very same places as civilizations that you know, were not uh, or did not originate from Africans, that the Great Zimbabwe, so called, was not an African achievement but a product of some uh, lost white tribe or whoever, but not Africans. So this is uh, Miss Law, the wife of a missionary writing from uh, the Mad Zimbabwe in 1894, again, writing in the Kefa Express, now called the Christian Express. Yesterday, we too, Mr. Law and myself, walked to Zimbabwe, which is about four miles distant from here, I believe the general idea is that it was once a large hidden temple. It does really look like it. And if it is, the thought came to me, how glad we should be that God has honored us to send us to perform the true God almost on the very place where once the grossest idolatry was practiced. They were setting up a Morganster a mission which produced many, many Zimbabweans, many teachers, many evangelists. Many people are very, very proud of that mission station to the present. This is how it was produced. And this is the purpose for which it was produced. And as I indicated, these people were burying themselves right there on these uh, sacred spaces where they were claiming were spaces of idolatry. This is um, Alan Wilson's first grave. I don't know if you guys have gone through the Great Zimbabwe, have seen this grave right close to the museum before it was moved to Matopo after Rhodes was buried there in 1902. Why were they burying themselves on our sacred spaces? If you have been to Matopo, you have also seen this edifice that commemorates brave men, Alan Wilson and his uh, settler col uh, colon, which was decimated by Lobengula's uh, troops in uh, 1893. They were brave men, we are told. This is how these passes were being cleared for colonial uh, monumentalization. All these African functionaries were arrested, being killed, they stripped naked, uh, put in jail in uh, leg irons, hung, demonized. Rain uh, functionaries, priests, Macombre. This was the design. This is what this is what we have. This is the outcome. So when all these olives and others write about uh, religion in Africa, this story, this background story is never heard. This is how African became uh, Christian. 
this is how, Afri how African became uh, Islamic through bullets, Bibles, and Quran. This is how Africans became Christian. When the men were killed during and after the colonial invasion wars, these African children were now orphans. These are African mothers and women who have now become uh, orphans and widows. And look at the uh, missionaries there, the stepfathers, they stepped, stepped in to take the place of Africans, African men in African uh, self-reproduction. They call themselves father, father. That's what they meant. Took this to, I got this, this image from uh, the National uh, Archives in Zimbabwe. You can see the caption there says, Tavi Matabele women and children at Hope Fountain. It was not an accident that the missionaries called their mission stations, these cross where they put Africans uh, like animals, that they named them uh, with uh, names like that. What was the hope? Whose hope? What was this audacity? Hope Fountain, the fountain of hope. Who was hoping for what? This became the first crop, the first crop of uh, African mass conversion. After the wars, I'm reading tons and tons of colonial documents on the anti-colonial war of uh, 1893 and 96, 97. Uh, these are the images. After those wars, after Africans um, uh, surrendered or were defeated, they continued to destroy African homes and burn down African greeneries and farms and fields and food crops to produce this wretched, this wretchedness that you see in this image. To deliver these Africans, the caption to say, well, oh, these wretched wretches were given to the mission station to be fed. You don't hear that they destroyed African homes and food crops and granaries, and they chased these people for, for months in the forest and they raped them in the post-war reprisals. This is in many ways the story of the NGO today. This is what Professor Mao also has called the criminal humanitarianism. This is its origins. NGOs are not there to build African capacity. They are there to subvert it. Because they are not NGOs even. They are governmental organizations. Which governments? Not ours. OK, I will not bore you with uh, the details. But this is this are, this are, this about the, the post-war reprisals. Again, targeting Kaguri and Nyanda, which is what they called Nehanda. Because as long as Kaguri and Nehanda were alive, there'd be no peace in this land. But again, what is peace? And again, the story of the missionary is Father Bila De, uh, the key missionary at Shawasha. It suggested that, well, you need to destroy these people's food if, uh, if you are going to get these people. This is from, uh, from back a uh, religion chronicler. And that's exactly what they did. Killed these spirit mediums, destroyed people's food, took the children to the mission stations. And right there, I've got this photo in my book. You can see how the little African children there are parading in white dresses and shirts, actually blouses. Those boys are wearing blouses, as the text says. Neander's children, when she was murdered, were taken to Shasha mission right there, kicking and screaming. And she was traumatized. People who went to see her there, uh, tell the stories of how traumatized she was. She had seen her parents, her whole family destroyed and killed. And she was taken by force to the mission station like many, many others. 
And this photo illustrates a lot of dynamics about how the church ended its school because they were one and the same thing came out of our lens as instruments of a pestinicide. I often remark about those people who are sitting on the margins who are not quite part of those uh, parading so-called civilization, but they are close by. Uh, by and by, they're getting in, they're being absorbed, they're being co-opted. They are not sure, they're reading this alien institution that has come onto our land. Uh, they want to see what's, what, what's, what is happening there. The stories that they hear uh, from their children when they come from the mission, sometimes they come during days of uh, festivity to see for, the, for themselves. Sugar, sweets, and things are being doled out. This is uh, how African identities are being uh, produced as shameful. Those hiddens on the margins and those who are dressed in uniform, church, church and school uniform are celebrated. This is a pestimicide destruction of uh, African worldviews and knowledge systems. This is the story of Neander's child. He was renamed from Makandi Pei when she went to the, when she was taken to the mission, renamed Mary Ann. What does naming signify? Today, we've got millions of Mary Ann's uh, running around the continent. Uh, thinking again through the sonic musical um, vista, that mbira is not there. It's not one of those instruments that those African youngsters uh, are holding and playing in that uh, uh, stacked photo there. It's about sonic disarmament because mbira is a very, very important cultural instrument. It calls the ancestors into those spaces that I talked about, uh, the spaces of self-reproduction. They were being disarmed. Sonic re-engineering. Now these children were told, now well, over the decades, they became uh, uh, fellow creatures. It was initially the creature fellows. This is Andrew Hartman uh, writing in the Zambezi mission record in 1903. And Hartman, that name saw, rings a bell, Hartman House, one of those schools that rich Africans in Zimbabwe take their children to. What is the agenda in the colonial um, education policy? Uh, I discussed that at length in chapter one of, of this book, to re-engineer them from being uh, who they are, to become uh, colonial subjects. You hit the mind. And uh, again, there was, this was not an accident. There was uh, clear wisdom in what the missionaries in the colonial state were doing. As one missionary wrote in his amazing mission record in July 1905, if the people of Africa are to be brought to a, to a knowledge of the love of God, it must be through the instrumentality of their own children. They were targeting African children, they were targeting the African future. Rather than uh, toward uh, the, the Commission of Native Education uh, in, in 1925, that our great object in building schools was evangelizing the native. When I first came to Southern Rhodesia, I walked from crow to crow and found it useless until we started schools. Start with the children. This is cultural genocide. This is why, again, you, we have all these uh, big mission stations that have remained famous to the present. This photo uh, was taken at Kutama Mission. Okay, maybe one of those little ones, your guess is as good as mine. Which one is uh, the great Robert Mugabe there? What are they doing there? They are singing uh, from hymns and blowing um, uh, you know, these, these Western, Westernized instruments. 
This is what Mugabe said about uh, these spaces. We lived in Christian villages. We were born there. And no heathens, as, we, as they were called, were allowed in. Our grannies were heathens outside. We were not allowed to go out. So what the missionaries and the government did was to construct what they called the Christian villages around these mission stations, separating them from what they called the pagan villages, those Africans who refused this agenda of death. They were demonized, ostracized as heathens. And one missionary wrote, some pagan families were still to be found in the Christian villages. A little feminist has proved sufficient to make them move to separate pagan crops. What is a little feminist? Dogs and whips, destruction of homes. And how do they determine that this one was pagan and this one was Christian? You are found playing your tom-tom there or calling your ancestors or playing in beer. You are in trouble. As Tela told me in 2012, as she grew up in Mondoro, we were instructed to run and report our parents and neighbors to the priest at St. Michael's mission whenever we saw them playing Mbira, Ngome and Osho, the Saturn's people, we were told. The destruction of the African family, the weaponization of the African child, the use of uh, sound instruments. So by the 1930s, this agenda had produced the results because in one of the chapters in the book, I talk about uh, how these African converts pressured the European, because the Europeans and Africans belong to different mission bodies. So they, the native Christians prevailed on their white counterparts to you know, push the state to investigate what they called naive night dances that were happening around the country. And the whole nationwide uh, investigation was conducted, reports coming from all kinds of places about how the missionaries, the native commissioners, the location superintendents, African chiefs and others uh, had done to repress, to destroy these evil night dances. These Africans going about their own cultures, enjoying themselves. This is how, I mean, a lot of musicians today, if you ask them in Zimbabwe and elsewhere, how they became musicians. Oh, I grew up singing in the church choir, in the school choir. This was, this became the authorized register. You stand like that, you're singing in this, this is a tonic uh, sofas. You are singing Jesus now. A lot of my colleagues look at uh, spaces like Mime Swords, those who have been to Mbari. Uh, Mime Sozi uh, became a, a very important uh, cultural space uh, in the colonial reserves called uh, locations, what I call dislocations, spaces where Africans were dislocated to when their lands were, were taken by force and violence. Uh, and when these Africans were coming from the mission schools, now grown, uh, they've imbibed these uh, mission ideas. Where do they spend their Sunday, that day of the week when they are not working for the colonial uh, exploiter? Mime Swords, Stanley War, Blau Art, performing these healthy entertainments, civilized Christian entertainments. What you don't see in a lot of people who romanticize these spaces is how these spaces uh, basically represent. Uh, uh, they represent suppressed memories. They are spaces for the recreation uh, of the subjugated African. And who was Maim Sodzi? Neander's uh, niece, the very same murdered Mbuya Neander's niece, 
one of those were taken Shawasha mission. Now became a Catholic model and agent of Catholicism, deployed back to her own people to continue the colonial agenda. And Sonia Yugushini, this uh, again, uh, white professor of African history, tells us that um, Mam Sodzi was um, one of the leaders in the origins of African feminism in Zimbabwe, this celebration without reflection. This is the late um, Abel Snamesi Stolle, a fighter for the war of liberation uh, in Zapu, one of the two people on the face of my book. These uh, recreation wars, as they were called, should really be called recreation with that uh, a stroke there. What was being uh, recreated there, a particular kind of African subject. So that day of the week when you're not working for the colonist as a domestic worker or in the factory doing cheap and labor, you're supposed to expand all your political energies and anger in these controlled spaces. We are given uh, colonial awards for being the best behave, uh, behaved native. The idea was that uh, to, you know, we were making the less native uh, work, that one who beats 500 uh, bits of the tom tom. I was taken there to work, but it's not enough to teach the native the dignity of labor, as they call it. We must also teach them to play and to play healthfully. That is civilized entertainment, not those uh, native amusements that the colonist was uh, uh, denigrating uh, in the 1870s. What has happened here? This is a process of uh, re-engineering of African consciousness and reduction of Africans into equipment for colonial profit. And African cultures are very, very important instrument to weaponize in this regard. These infrastructures were also built. Uh, how were they built? Uh, again, I was involved in, in some debate with one of my colleagues in the University of Zimbabwe. I was saying, ah, but the colonial uh, governments built us all these spaces. Now our governments are neglecting them. OK. Do we actually understand these urban spaces that we are very proud of, these colonial service centers and these colonial reserves in the city? These were built through uh, what the municipalities called the Kefa Beer Fund. This was colonization on the cheap. Africans brewed their beer for millennia. When the colonizers came, they took it. They forbid Africans from uh, producing and drinking it uh, as they wanted. Now the, the colonial municipalities mass produced it and sold it to Africans for their own profit. That's the man that was used to build these structures to further subjugate Africans is architectures of control. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to end here. Uh, but with just a few ways to say Africans never gave up their cultures. Uh, Africans continue to resist. Uh, Africans never said we have been defeated. By the 1950s, 1970s, again, you can see how the very same demonized cultures are brought to uh, spaces of entertainment, uh, which was more than entertainment. Here's a photo of uh, Mkanya there, Thomas Mabfumo dressed like a shikiro, a spirit medium, um, you know, on stage. Look at that Ghana that is holding there. The message is never, is never uh, stopped. So part of what I do in my work and in this book is to historicize uh, the idea of these cultures of resistance against this assault. Africans continued uh, to exercise their, uh, their cultural uh, sovereign, even though it was attacked. Because as uh, Ahmed Sokotore uh, uh, wrote in 1969, for us to speak of culture is to fight. And we've chosen to carry the data of this combat forward into the present era. Uh, this is the logic that underlies my upcoming book, Chimurenga Afrosonicity. 
uh, the cultures of resistance, the Chimurenga music that Mafumi and others are known for, as a foundation for African self-liberation and for the building of the new nation states that we have uh, today. This is what I wanted to talk about initially. Uh, people like John Mapondera, for example, uh, did significant work in the diaspora, uh, utilizing these very same demonized African cultures to give Africans who were scattered and displaced in these uh, jungles uh, their voice. Uh, they basically, because they grew up in the African uh, uh, context, they took uh, the very same African species, the yard, the kitchen, the African homestead, and um, use that to frame African theater in the UK, for example. And uh, by doing that, they were basically modeling independent uh, Africa, independent Zimbabwe. This is how um, Pondera, for example, uh, brought the idea of the culture house. That's how he built the Morewa Culture Center as the prototype of what he was doing um, uh, countrywide, a part of, of what he was modeling in the UK with his work with uh, drum, uh, an African-led and owned centered NGO uh, that he led. Uh, inviting uh, African cultural producers and thinkers and scholars like Ngugi Wationgo and uh, uh, Ola, Ola um, uh, from Nigeria and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of others. Because Africans in the world during the colonial period were, uh, were, were demonized and were marginalized. And what was the diagnosis? Well, because your cultures and your being have been demonized, uh, you become nothing, you're seen as nothing. This is part of the larger agenda. So how do we come back from uh, this assault? Let's insist on, on our humanity, utilizing our cultures to rearm ourselves in the same way that um, uh, these cultures basically became a mobilizing weapon for uh, the armed struggles uh, that would start in the 1960s. That's why Chimurenga music became so important to mobilize people uh, who went to fight, to train as guerrillas uh, in the camps where I'm currently going to speak with uh, folks, but also to gather materials to tell that story of African uh, uh, self-liberation. But it's a story that uh, you can trace back even to the mission station where those children were uh, dragged, kicking and screaming, never gave up. They were singing songs in their own African languages, such as our children uh, uh, cry, uh, they mourn for the death of Africa. This is in the 1920s. What Lana Mataka, one let uh, uh, musician, uh, sang to me uh, in the 2000s. Uh, they saw colonization as, as death, the death of Africa and they were mourning the death of Africa, not celebrating colonization as a civilization or a civilizing mission. Uh, this is what, another song that Mbuyam Lambo, the lead, sang for me um, in 2000. These children were, were mourning the poverty of their fathers. And how did they diagnose that poverty? Their country, their lands were taken. Uh, their freedom, their sovereignty were taken uh, by the kneeless ones. They are kneeless because they don't bend down to do their own chores, not because they wore trousers. So song like, songs like this uh, you know, help us to imagine the African uh, psyche back in the day, 1930s. They were singing right there, the mission stations. Tinorwa, we fight. We fight for our country taken by the Boers. We fight. This is uh, my father's uh, song. Whoa, because when, when uh, my great ancestor was killed and his head is right there in the museums uh, of, of, of London as, as we speak today, in uh, they formed, they, the name was, uh, was, was banned. That's why I'm called Chwash Chukowero Day. Chukowero was Chwashira's father. And so they still formed the choir. 
using the very same authorized register, Chowashara Brothers Choir at Kwenda Mission in the 1950s. And what were they singing? The story of uh, the destruction of Africa through enslavement and colonization. Uh, our ancestors were taken uh, those many centuries ago by the Arabs, uh, by the whites, how they were alienated and taken away to the faraway lands, America, where they were sold like chicken and cattle because they were not seen as humans. And they would place one person at the corner of the building as they sang these songs to see if the, uh, the missionary, who was also in many cases happened to be the, the headmaster, was coming. This was resistance in tight corners. These are some of my, well, now or let, the last one close to my brother, then Black, uh, passed away uh, three weeks ago. He was the last of my fathers, the Chwashara Brothers Choir. Okay, um, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for that absolutely riveting journey. Um, I, I am still taking it all in. Uh, I thought I knew my fair bit of history, but you, you have uh, once again proven that every day is an opportunity for learning new things as well as reinforcing the knowledge that was lost. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and uh, intellects for this absolutely, uh, absolutely insightful presentation. I would like to uh, invite Laurie just to comment before we invite any of our participants uh, to, to field some questions. Uh, please don't feel intimidated to ask the professor questions. I am lucky enough in my life experience to be able to call the professor a friend. And so I promise you that he will answer all your questions um, with the, the, the greatest of uh, sensitivities. So please, I, I would urge you all to loosen up your vocal cords or your fingers and type some questions in there. Laurie, I'll hand over to you for now. Thanks, Nat. Well, Professor, the other day when we had the initial conversation, I didn't know you were going to deliver this. Um, this is worthy of a, of a lecture in a, in, in a history, in a historical context for students who perhaps are studying history. Because I think one of the key things as I was listening, we're all quite aware of our European history to the point where we perhaps understand even as far back as the medieval England sort of time. Because when you're talking about some of the elements of what you're talking about, which is happening on the African continent throughout, there's a lot of things that are symbolic. The, the use of faith, you know, the whole idea of Christianity we see so many movies and books and reenactment about trying to get rid of witches and wizards and so on and so forth and burning people at the stake and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot of this that echoes, but I think listening to everything just brings it into full circle. And, and I think one of the things you were talking about, and, and I appreciate what, what you see when you, when you said the word image, you know, it's not just image, and I think it would be wonderful if you could explain to everyone that there's an expression that you have for the word image, where you said I, and then you imagine that. I think people, it would be very insightful for you to explain that because I think your work allows people to perhaps look at themselves differently, especially when they understand how you view image. So could you explain that image, how you have now changed that and what you're using with that with your students? Uh, thanks, thanks, Maswan. Um, yeah, there, 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 there is often uh, that shadow that is cast over us when stories of uh, the violence 
of uh, religions is taught uh, in Europe. Uh, but also out of that came what? Came the so-called enlightenment. Uh, and a lot of African uh, scholars and scholars of Africa would teach Africans, they teach the enlightenment story uh, as, as, um, as, as a project that missionaries brought to Africa. Uh, but what enlightenment are they bringing to Africa? The very same violence uh, that they under gone undertaken uh, in Europe and worse. So that what we call enlightenment, what they call enlightenment, uh, that's their definition. To us, it was an darkenment. That's why they produced the image of Africa as a dark continent. Uh, they imagined that, they produced that through the kinds of images that they sketched uh, of Africa. Africa is a place of lack, it's a place of violence. Uh, the slave trade as they, as they write. So um, made Africans so depraved that they began to eat, eat each other. You must go there uh, to civilize them. Uh, the agency in the subject of that violence is distorted in how things are framed and defined. We are told about the slave trade. Who were the enslavers? The very same people were supposed to be civilizing Africans. Um, and, 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 and Christianity is supposed now to enlighten Africans. But what is, um, you don't enlighten people with light. You don't, you don't, you don't illuminate uh, light. You have, got, you have got to have uh, blown out the light in order to, 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 to light it again. You don't empower people who have got their own power. You must have done something to deprive those people of their power in the first place. So NGOs that talk about empowerment, they're doing exactly the opposite and they're not diagnosing why and where African power went to. Which is why, again, uh, I always insist on um, our own definition of things for ourselves. Because uh, self-reproduction, which can mean many things, the Liberation Project, for example, is only a process that is um, supposed to produce and project us in the world. That's how I use the idea of image. Thanks for asking that. Um, it is I and I, as the African and Rastafarian uh, thinkers uh, put it. It's I and I, the I image. I'm imagining the world, I'm producing the world in my own image. It's I and I in the communitarian African philosophical uh, framing. I and I does not, me, does not mean me, I and myself, no. It's a, a communitarian uh, brethren uh, imagination of uh, the self in the world and uh, the harmony and, uh, and, and amity uh, that we define in our context as UNU. Thank you, I don't want to go on, uh, but I, I, I hope I have uh, answered you. We can, we can listen to you. Um indeterminately professor thank you so much i have a couple of questions from one of our attendees here i'll start with the first one if you don't mind uh, first of all um the attendee is actually um the chairman of the african caribbean support organization here in northern ireland um and he first of all says thank you to the professor really appreciate this presentation um Question one, can he comment a little on the significance of Walter Rodney's publication, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa? And question two, uh, do you have any comment on the contribution of Marcus Mosiah Garvey for the prioritizing and respect of African identity? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wish you had told me the name of the esteemed uh, leader there. But, my, uh, my apologies. It is, is simply 
I'm overwhelmed by the I information <laughs> coming through. Uh, sorry, his name is Dr. Living, uh, Dr. Good Lord. <laughs> his name is Dr. Livingston Thompson. Uh, oh. That is our chairman. Sorry, I just went blank for a second there. I'm sure I'm going to get fired for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my apologies for putting you on the spot, uh, Nyat. <laughs> I know you can get disturbed last when you are thinking many things. But <laughs> That's fine. I'm sure you'll forgive me. <laughs> I, he should forgive you. Um, thank you, Dr. Livingstone. Um, the work of uh, Dr. Rodney is very, very significant. Um, it's, it's people like him and others that uh, are the scatterings of Africa uh, that were trying, some of us who are children on this journey, they're trying to emulate and use as a, as a pedestal uh, to think through the predicament of a scattered and a disarmed people were still fighting the, the war for rearmament. We've not won that, uh, that, that war. We think we have, no, we haven't. So I think with him, uh, what he calls underdevelopment uh, goes to the heart of what we misunderstand when we talk about ourselves and our countries today is uh, the developing world. Uh, in his introduction, uh, I've got a copy of his book there. Um, he talks about uh, the idea of development of underdevelopment. Uh, that development as we know it, as it is postulated in the so-called first world, uh, the world that enriched and developed itself through plunder, plundering the world that then became underdeveloped. Uh, there are two sides of the same coin. If you look at uh, the foundations of uh, these, these, these lands, uh, the Americas and, 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 and Europe, the store of uh, the so-called industrial revolution, uh, the energy for that is African energy. Uh, it is African uh, labor, which is uh, uh, enforced labor, a uh, cheapened labor. Uh, it is the labor of um, Africans on the continent who are forced to produce all these things that are taken through an equal exchange, an unwilling exchange, and just confiscation on the continent. Uh, that, that is the whole idea of um, uh, underdevelopment. It is a regressive a uh, uh, situation, a regressive movement. It is not an original uh, condition of being underdeveloped. There is no undeveloped uh, state. There is no undeveloped country. It is uh, a negative response to exploitation, the draining of resources, the draining of energy, uh, like open veins on a body. As one Latin American scholar wrote about rail lines, that many Africans mistake for development. The colonists build rail lines, they build this, they build that. All these are leading outwards. They are not internally integrated to promote African uh, production and, and self-reliance. They are draining things from the continent to the ports. Is that development? No, that is under development. Um, and, and so if, if you cast that, in the Zimbabwean register, as we all must do, must think together, that is Shuramatong. What is Dongo? Dongo is a destroyed, a ruined home. And when there's a particular snake that um, is believed, that when you see, uh, when you see, it's portending uh, ruination. And people say, ah, oh, okay, something is going to happen. Somebody's going to die in this family. You don't see this snake uh, ordinarily. So when something like uh, the, the HIV virus is unleashed on a people, that is Shuramatong. That's why HIV is also called Shuramatong. 
So when the mission, the missionary came to, Af to the African continent, um, it came as Shuramatong, a project of ruination. That's why uh, our homes where these children were, were, were being uh, snatched away from. That's why even we followed in the, in the same uh, footsteps. When you go to these colonial schools, we never go back to our homes that uh, produced us. We are continuing the project of uh, producing Matongo, ruination. That is under development. We are not plugging the open veins, which is why the work of um, our ancestors, like uh, Marcus Mosiah Gavi, is very, very important. This was uh, a philosophy of how to plug the open veins to stop the, hem the hemorrhage. So if today, uh, thanks to the crisis that gave us Zoom, now we talk to each other in real time. If we harness ourselves in our energy, mental, uh, monetary, cultural, uh, we, re we remember, we put ourselves limp and limp together because we've dismembered. Now we can uh, rebuild. That is rearmament. Thank you. Lori, um, do you have anything to uh, add to that, to comment on? Th th um, uh, Dr. Livingston says, thank you very much. Excellent uh, response to his uh, question there. Thank you, sir. So if I could ask you, Professor, yeah, I know you're talking about rearmament, right? How do we safeguard the idea of our heritage? Because I think through everything you've told us that we have a history, like the young girl whose name is now changed to Marianne. And we all know significantly from a cultural perspective, we are named with purpose and your destiny is embedded in your name, especially from a cultural perspective by some of the names I've, I've heard. Like even, you know, I think one of the names was um, as if to suggest I've been, I've been put in poverty. I think it was it Muya Nehanda's daughter. Her name suggests the, the lacking in her life and then only for her to be renamed Marianne. It's not the same thing. So that lack is further implicated by a name that doesn't even, I think it just worsens an already bad situation. So how do we then, yes, we get all of these names and yes, we have all of this supposed development and the fascinations of, of this being disarmed. How do we then disarm, find that unity, preserve our heritage and identity? How can we do that? Thank you, Baswan. Uh, my mother, you are my mother. Well, you'll have to explain this because you're calling this one Yati and you're calling me Maswan. So they don't understand what this means, Professor. We'll have to explain that. <laughs> thank, thank you. So that actually maybe is the answer to your question. Thanks, thanks for coming back with the further question on that one. Um, so today people want to trace their heritage, uh, to trace and track their footpaths uh, or the spoor of the sheep that scattered them. They do DNA uh, tests. Uh, the most foolproof DNA ever is this cosmological self-understanding that we have in practice here. My mother uh, is a Masivanda, like you. You are my mother's uh, younger sister. That means you are my mother. Uh, uh, this is the African self-conception uh, of identity and uh, belonging together. This is the story of uh, African nation making. 
beyond the Berlin lines and the Berlin walls that tried to further scatter us. Because if you go to Tanzania, you find a nyati there. Uh, you find, I think there is a man love here from Kenya uh, as one of the attendees. Uh, you are going back in time. This is a blood uh, relationship and a code of relationships. Uh, if you do DNAs of these people who call themselves with a particular uh, totem, you go back to their common ancestors. Uh, they keep they keep this DNA uh, in the languages, in the honorific titles, in the in the daily register um, of, of uh, communication uh, and 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 and, and uh, self understanding. Uh, so again, when I thank you, I'm not thanking uh, Laurie. I'm thanking uh, the ancestors that gave us you, that you represent. I'm thanking them. Uh, I'm, I'm invoking them. I'm calling them. This is Mutupo. This is Watep. So it's the deeper self-understanding that would really help us to rearm, to bring back the armor that was stolen, that was destroyed. But you cannot destroy this inner cosmological DNA. Uh, we simply have to understand our, uh, the depths of our history. Uh, people say, ah, how do we understand this history? How do we reconstruct it now that, uh, well, maybe there are no written records? These are the written records. Uh, this is the written record. This will be right here. I play this mirror here. I play, um, I play on here. I speak with my ancestor now. I ask her questions. Okay, uh, the great one. How come you were overpowered by these people without knees? He tells me his story. So we underestimate our power and the knowledge systems is foundations uh, for bringing us up again is a source for regeneration. And we saw, again, to go back to your question, um, we need to understand the logics of the witchcraft that missionaries uh, cast upon us how they crafted the African that they wanted. Because in many ways, we are the African that we joined Rhodes and others uh, were, were projecting 50 years, 100 years from then. We want nine tenths of Africans to be viewers of, 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 of wood and the drawers of water. How do we do that? Destroy their cultures, build them schools and uh, do an education policy that teaches them nonsense. Just the basic errors so that they can take instructions as uh, messengers and cheap, cheap and deliverers. So when we celebrate uh, the schools that missionaries built without looking at the content and the, and the psychology, we are doing ourselves a great disservice. We've got to understand the mission. What is the mission? The destruction of Africans. We cannot build anything if you don't understand the destructive mission of re-nation. Hassan. You go right to the heart of the, of the matter, Professor, which is, which is what we need. These are the types of conversations that are relevant. So do you believe when we're saying things like, decolonization. Can people become decolonized or are we still going to have to struggle with what colonialism and its, and its foundations created? Can we eradicate it? So you ask something that's, uh, that goes to the heart of the predicament. Uh, you know, um, I've got a couple of uh, graduate, African graduate students um, 
one of the problems in living in a very nice place like Santa Barbara is that uh, the cost of living is up the ceiling. And in terms like uh, the COVID crisis, which we ill understand still, um, was that uh, food impoverishment is a serious, serious issue. It's a, it's a global problem that Africans face. Uh, and very sadly on the continent itself uh, often because it becomes so dependent on the parasites. As uh, one of my friends, Nashamboti, uh, says, we are like hosts who now depend on the parasite. Now, how does that work? That's the predicament of uh, coloniality. Because with those students, uh, uh, I started uh, an Uhuru gardening project where we grow uh, uh, most of the food that they need in terms of vegetables, actual food, not foodstuffs, what my friend uh, in Jatika Boy from Kenya calls foodstuffs, which is most of what we eat. Toxic chemical things from the shops. That's not food, that's foodstuffs. There is more stuff in there than food. And so I was holding a tomato uh, one of these, uh, our, our garden uh, um, uh, moments, it's also a learning uh, space uh, outside of the four walls. So I was holding a tomato that something had burrowed into. And I said, ah, guys, let's, let's look at this tomato. Uh, I think you can uh, think about many things uh, using this uh, tomato as, as an allegory. Uh, I think it can allow us to understand colonization. So the pest goes in there, it eats, it deposits its eggs, maybe it dies, it has done its job, it has carried out its mission. Maybe it exits, maybe it dies in there, but the eggs are there, they're gonna hatch. This thing is now self-reproducing inside uh, something that is very good. We don't use chemicals in that garden. Uh, maybe you are gonna eat that tomato, but the eggs are in there. What are you eating? You are eating uh, things that are going to hatch maybe in your in your body. Uh, some of these things can actually go up all the way to your brain. You end up with this disease that you really don't understand. That's how colonization really works. Uh, it gets internalized because we were reproduced and recreated in these mission schools uh, through the witches, uh, which is what I call the missionaries. That process was witchcrafting. We were crafted into what we are today through this vile uh, agenda. Uh, so as products of that system, do you actually understand that this is the thing that was done to us to begin with? So the problem is to uh, how to diagnose uh, col colonialism and coloniality. And are we the best person to now uh, fix this problem? If uh, a leader of uh, your nation, a great liberation fighter, was born in a so-called Christian village, and when, you are, when he's talking to you as a nation, he's busy playing with the rosary around his neck, As he left the Christian village, as the Christian village left him, the colon is now in his mind. Now, how do we decolonize? I don't know. There's a lot of uh, decolonizing this, decolonizing that today. I tend to prefer self-liberation as a concept. Uh, but we can only do that once we understand what it is that uh, infected us to begin with. It's an ongoing process. People like Ngugationgo and others have returned, decolonizing the mind. And again, I mentioned Nyashamboti is really um, with his uh, series of books, one of the first of which is coming out now, is uh, 
teaching us about the depth, but also the metamorphosis of uh, oppression. His, uh, his, his, his book series is called Apartheid Studies, subtitled A Manifesto. Mind blowing uh, scholarship. Colonialism uh, is something that we allowed to naturalize, uh, to hide, as he says, in plain sight, with independence, with the truth and reconciliation commissions that really didn't tell any truth and didn't reconcile anything. Uh, those rituals of independence, which hide uh, the continued and now normalized hyper exploitation of Africans uh, as people who live, again, as he, call, as he says, people who live in harm's way. We have not moved ourselves out of harm's way. So how do we decolonize? We've got to understand the depth of the problem first. Check out by somewhere. We've got to extract it. I like what the professor said there, which is an expression we use a lot in, in, in Zimbabwean expression, especially in Shona. It's where, for example, if you have to think about being stabbed, where you're stabbed and the item that stabbed you broke which means it's now embedded inside you and to extract it is not so easy. It's not as simple as pulling it out as it was you know, used to stab you in the first place. But I think you're right, Professor. The self-liberation is the way forward. We have to have a progressive mindset. And I think the key is in the mindset. The battleground is now in the mind for us to realize who our true self is. And as you've said, these conversations are the grounds for us to re-understand that I and I concept you're talking about is in, in my image. And then I suppose this reinforces, I think there's a lot of expression around Ubuntu working together. Takura, I'll come to you. I think I saw some comments. Were there any comments and questions? And then we've got a raised hand um, waiting for us to address. Them. Thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't see the raised hand. Um... I have a question for you, uh, Professor, from uh, Carol Nyakachana, uh, a community member here in Northern Ireland. Uh, first of all, I'll just read exactly what she says so you can get the spirit of it. Thank you so much. Join her network and Aksoni and Professor Muse. We are grateful for you educating us. I really learned a lot tonight. Where can we purchase Professor Chikowero's books, please? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nat. Uh, you know, we can, we can uh, begin to talk about that thing and uh, take another two hours. The political economy of knowledge and knowledge production. <laughs> the, so the book, the, the short answer, the quick and short answer is that the book is available uh, at Indiana Invest Press, uh, iup.edu. You can get uh, the soft cover, you can get a hard cover, you can get an e-book e that you can start reading now. I think there's also an audio version of it. Um, but the, the long answer is more complicated. Uh, at a limited number of these books, uh, one influential colleague, well, somebody who became a colleague, actually brother, who listened to uh, me talking about the book in Zimbabwe, allowed me to ship uh, boxes of it, put them in the National Gallery and elsewhere at the airport. Now they are sold out. Uh, our publishers in, in Zimbabwe and elsewhere on the continent, they don't invest in knowledge production. Uh, very, 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 difficult uh, subject. But Professor Zeleza talks about the manufacturing of, of African studies and crisis. Uh, his book, he could not be published here in the US. Uh, he had published it in, uh, in, uh, in Senegal. But it, it, it hits hard. It hits hard, not just at uh, the colonial system, but also uh, our species of knowledge production on the continent. 
which don't invest in knowledges that we should really uh, invest uh, in. Uh, I tried to get uh, published on the continent to co-publish this book on the continent. You get the usual, usual. Uh, it's not the syllabus, which syllabus is it on, what, what, what. Some knowledge you don't put on a syllabus. So who has the money to set up uh, publishing uh, uh, presses on the continent? Maybe I should abandon this whole research and writing and just do publishing. It's a huge industry that is colonially uh, controlled. But the book is there. Uh, also Amazon, but I don't own Amazon. So I don't know, get maybe two cents if you buy it on Amazon or even uh, from my publishers, I'll get two cents. But the, but the knowledge is worth much more than two cents, I hope, and the satisfaction that we are reading our own uh, 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 ideas. Well, we will be sure to, to preserve, at least maybe hide a book in the ground somewhere <laughs> and just give <laughs> us a map so we know where it is. <laughs> but um, I, I think Trent has got his hand raised. Trent, I'm going to allow you to speak if you want to, and then you can address the professor directly if you'd like. So I'm just gonna allow you to speak if that's okay. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I just wanted to go back to the self-liberation uh, issue uh, or concept or what you spoke about. I think that's, I agree, that's where sort of the key is because for me, sometimes I feel very hopeless, if I can put it that way, you know, I'm quite conscious of some of the things, what's going on, but there are times when you wake up and you think, are we going to get out of this? Is this going to happen in our time? Is there any progress? Because I can't see the measurement of the progress of who is crossing the line. Uh, all I'm faced with every single day is there seems to be very, very little progress, if any. Otherwise, there is actually going backwards. And the kind of um, tools that are used to measure the, the, the progress I'm not sure whether they are uh, our own terms of what we sh well, should I call them our own terms or not our own terms, or maybe a new terms of reference for what we might call reference. And I just, I'm faced with a vicious circle of different concept of how we measure what we call progress, which leaves us with a lot of uh, no unity. I can't find a unifying point. So when you mentioned self-liberation, uh, I'm thinking, wow, that's where the answer could be, or that's where the answer is. But obviously the language uh, that we use is not our own tool. And I think by utilizing that tool on its own, you know, it also always leaves us short somewhere, somehow. But going back to the self-liberation itself, uh, can you, I don't know, give us just a little bit um, on self-liberation and how we can try to help ourselves, our families, each other, that's number one. And two, how do we measure ourselves' progress in such a divided um, you know, uh, ourselves is divided as we are. Okay, thank thanks. You. Thank, okay. You. thank you, thank you, thank you, brother man. Um, yeah, I do share your <clears throat> your frustration. Uh, it is a story. It is a story of uh, our existence. It is that state of uh, uh, and consciousness of um, being uh, disarmed. So the the first the first thing I think basic, basically is uh, the language, the language that we use, um, where we are using uh, Chiduna here now, uh, English, Chiduna. 
the language of uh, the ghosts who came to do these things uh, to us. Um, we can we can often use the tools, uh, you know, the limitations, the tools of the the witches to de-witch ourselves. Uh, it is possible, uh, but language can all just be uh, one way to articulate our thoughts. So we can uh, talk about language as a uh, language is something that is uh, just a means to get to our to our thought uh, process to our epistems um, because again the challenge for me when i'm writing when you do read the book you see that uh, i use a lot of uh, chikaranga words that some would call shona uh, but i don't use shona Shona is a colonial construct even. So these colonists didn't even stop at um, forcing us to speak their languages. They've been distorted uh, our own identities and what we call ourselves. Um, so the Kwandare for me then will be, okay, do I, do I write about Kujisunungura in the language of Kujisunungura, the Karanga language? Kujisunungura is to free oneself. Very, very clear. Wonder Sununguko, the war of liberation, Kujisunungura. We are starting from the source, uh, from what uh, our ancestors uh, and, 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 and theoreticians like uh, Amiko Cabral and, uh, uh, and, and others. You go back to where? To the source. Uh, unfortunately, Ngara is not in the circle now, but. Um, he does use those symbols to talk about African writing systems. Uh, that's where the knowledge is. Uh, the writing is there. If I take this, uh, it was kind of chilly day today, so I was uh, putting this uh, scarf around my neck. We've got writing systems that uh, encode our, our thought process and, uh, and, 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 um, and, and systems. So the Roman uh, system is can be taken as just a means. Uh, and then how do we measure? But if I go there, uh, if you look at the history of uh, African uh, language and, um, and education, I mean, by, by education, I mean self-education, not the colonial uh, system, uh, that really also came under severe attack and uh, erasure and silencing. And the languages that people used also attacked very much. We've lost a lot of the language uh, as a result. Um, so like if you look at Mozambique and the Portuguese, Africans were forbidden uh, from using their own language, which the Portuguese designated the dog's language. Now, when, when, when your whole language and uh, instruments of thought are designated as dog's language. Which child is going to proudly use that dog's language in both school and home? That ostracization, this production of identities of shame. You discard the language, what have you lost? So the over 2000, African languages have got uh, these deep understandings of what self-liberation is. Now we put all these languages together. None is bigger than the other. You now, if you, my, part of my work now uh, involves going to the liberation war camps where our fighters uh, were trained in the 1960s and 70s where the communities there talk about Wapigania uh, Uhuru, the fighters for self-liberation, for independence. The language is just a minor distance. The concept is the same. Even the language itself is basically the same thing. But what would we learn if we take seriously all these languages and make lots of them in, into our 
official languages and put them in the curriculum. Uh, and then so we go to the core of the concepts beyond the languages themselves. Then how do we make the progress if we are making progress? Uh, are we regressing, are we progressing? Uh, so the language itself again comes back uh, because we tend to use concepts that come to us predefined by the very same people who use the language of development when actually they mean uh, to, to destroy development. So that when they say developing countries, they're actually not, they're actually hiding what is actually happening on the continent. Because a lot of these countries that are called developing are actually not developing. It's a sanitizing uh, uh, rubric that's hiding what is actually happening, that what they're actually continuing to do. So we must discard a lot of this language. When we do things for ourselves and uh, when we heal ourselves of this ruination, when we try to fix things, when you try to regenerate the African life worlds, let's not use even the language of development. Terminology is, is very, very important. You can normalize uh, rot and ruination. But then if you look at uh, practical uh, instances in our lives as Africans, there are moments when you address this problem and when we really made significant uh, progress. Um, I, I, I ended up, I ended the talk with uh, those, those songs, those lyrics by students in mission stations. They didn't give up. They were fighting. Uh, in many ways, they were, they were singing the songs that had been uh, sung by their uh, parents and ancestors way back, going back to maybe the 1600s and 1400s when they fought the first Europeans who attempted to colonize us. They, we defeated them. That was significant uh, progress. The Koi, when the Koi beat the Portuguese in the 14 and 1500s, we don't identify and celebrate these uh, historical moments enough as lessons and models. We don't celebrate the fact that uh, in the Zimbabwean space, we beat the Portuguese in the 1600s and freed ourselves of their enslaving and colonizing agenda and captured their canons, which are still there in the museum in, uh, in, in, in Pretoria. So we hide all these things. We don't research sufficiently and tell ourselves properly the, the greatest moment in African history in the contemporary times, which is the wars of self-liberation. It's a project that did not uh, start and end there. It was not an event, it was a process. People who left the, their countries from Namibia, from Guinea, from elsewhere, uh, as Wakimbis, as the Swahili speakers would say, refugees, to come back as Wapigania or as liberation fighters. Uh, I would not have gone to even that colonial school to be able to think and rethink what it really means if people had not taken the gun to fight Smith and his folks who, who really, again, were making sure that we were only, only becoming viewers in wood of, of, of wood and drawers of water per rods uh, uh, design. So it's little chips as we go. Uh, that was Chimrenga. That war, these wars of African self liberation we can also call them Chimrenga. Because that's what Murenga, our great ancestor, uh, bestowed on us to fight for self-liberation. And hence Chimurenga, to fight like Murenga, this guerrilla wars. We need to wage what I call Chimurenga, Chepfungwa. Well, well, pull out the, the, the worm that infected our thinking and our, our epistems. The Chimurenga of the gun opened the door. What are we doing with the legacies of that? 
So I am going to the liberation uh, war camps in all these countries, speaking with people who hosted and trained and provisioned these people. And I'm talking to the fighters to understand that uh, process so that we can really say now, okay, what do we achieve? Let's do the accounting. Where is the story now? Where is the agenda now? How do we redefine it? How do we build on it? Because there is more investment in destroying that legacy than in celebrating and building on that legacy. But we don't take ourselves uh, seriously enough as a people. I mean, I go, I, uh, because sometimes because I'm un under-resourced, I'm doing videos with my phone. But if I'm studying uh, something about you know, some, some other subject that's not uh, threatening to the system, I'm given uh, equipment. What does that say about uh, knowledge production? Thank you so much, Professor. Um, one of the intriguing things about your talk for me personally is I consider myself a person that is um, very interested in the use of language, especially the colonial languages that we um, that we <clears throat> that we have been exposed to, namely English, French, and Spanish, Portuguese to a lesser extent, but still, I, I don't speak. Uh, much French, I don't speak any Spanish or Portuguese. However, obviously my competency is in English. And one of the, one of, you know, you learn something every day. And although I love analyzing words, one of the words that you, um, you mentioned today, recreation, that really, 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 really struck a chord with me because when you said it, I understood the meaning of it um, within the colonial and uh, oppressive uh, context, you know, recreating somebody to mold them into what you want so that they can be, as you said, hewers of wood and drawers of water. So I, I just wanted to comment on that. That really, it, it really struck a chord with me because again, it's a word that we use almost every day like all the other words you know rest and recreation you know i'm going to take some r and r after this long webinar so am i going to take out what the professor has just put in and recreate myself to mold myself back to what i was which is not who i am but i was molded or recreated into that person i mean wow no, no wonder I forgot the chairman's name, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're looking for, for an alibi, not, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. You're, <laughs> you're onto something serious. That, that's, that's really the point. It is. And, and I think you're right in everything you're saying, Professor. I mean, we could have you here for hours because I think what you're saying is at the root of a lot of things. And I think if we can get more of our, of our own, as in, ourselves that we can sit down with. And as you so rightfully said, the wisdom is among us. It's how do we find a way to uniform it, package it and keep it and keep mass producing it. That's the, the million dollar secret. And I don't know, Trent, do you feel you've been sufficiently answered? I know we've kept you up here just to reassure that you've been sufficiently answered. And if you haven't, please, get in touch with us. There's Exoni, there's Join Her. We would love to have further conversations. Um, are you based, where are you based, Trent, if we can ask, so we can perhaps pursue the conversation of Ubuntu, which is what we're trying to achieve? Yes, he's answered. Okay. Good day, Trent. Trent. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I don't know if there's no more questions in the room. Professor, I think you have left us with a lot to go and think about. The next time we're walking past the mirror, we have to make sure, are we, who are we seeing and whose image is being superimposed on the reflection, I guess is the million dollar question that we all need to answer. And if we're not sure, we can get in touch with you. 
there is more ways to have conversations further. I think we will be open for that and there will be more opportunities for everyone in the audience to engage with you further because I think your work is not done yet, Professor. We still have quite a lot for you to do and we will utilize this wealth of knowledge that you have and you can be as we need in our society at this moment one of those individuals who's sharpening us as iron sharpens iron, I think is, is the next venture that we're on. Takur, I'll come to you and perhaps you can wrap us up and we'll let everybody have their lives back. Uh, thank you. I'll just comment quickly. Um, Trent has just said, um, yes, he has been answered and he, hope, he hopes this will continue, uh, these kind of dialogues. I can assure you, Trent, that um, uh, Aksoni with our partners like join her and the prof the good professor we will continue to deliver um, as many programs as possible not only webinars but we have programs on the ground here in Northern Ireland that we are pursuing uh, the professor is in California there is nothing stopping us from reaching out to the professor bringing him here or going out to the mountain itself um, we are ready to do that. This is, um, I wanted to comment. Um, I wanted to comment on a question which was, uh, which Trent, I believe, asked um, about how we are, how we move forward in, in this, um, in this context. I just wanted to, to go back to a, a saying that you will find in many of our African cultures. Um, he who grows the tree does not grow it uh, expecting to sit in its shade. So as our ancestors Mbuya Nehanda, Kaguvi uh, and many others uh, fought for our liberty, they did not enjoy those liberties. So it is, it is, it is, it is a conscious acknowledgement that we must as adults and Africans and human beings, uh, we must accept that we are going to have to sacrifice for future generations. So we are not going to be the beneficiaries of this Chimurenga. However, there will be beneficiaries. Be assured of that. Asande sana, Nat. Totally agree. Asande sana, Yes. And Trent is also a Nat. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, 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 I, I've, I've never thanked you sufficiently, uh, Nyat Makon. Uh, I was with your father in August and you kind of touched on something that I've always wanted to really talk to you and your father about, uh, Elder, Nyat the Elder. Um, you know, the whole concept of uh, food is something that is really, really uh, significant. I'll be, I'll be home in uh, December. Maybe this time I'll actually sit down with him and talk about uh, what he and you are trying to do there at Kwam Rong. Uh, because food is one of the most important uh, vistas of colonization uh, and, and, and avenues for self-liberation. And so this is to say that what you're trying to do there with food, I don't know if you really fully consciously um, articulate this. Do you have uh, blueprints, as the colonizer said, blueprints on how to destroy us? Do you have blueprints on how to utilize food as one of our cultural weapons to free ourselves of the colonial foodstuffs that are killing us on the continent and in the world today? But again, this is to say, I don't want to elongate the conversation. This is just to say, again, uh, Asante Sana. Tinobonga. Noted. Noted, Anyat. Thank you. We seem to have two more comments before we close off. Uh, Charlene Machaira says, Thank you, Professor Mose. Thank you, Join Her and Aksoni. Thank you, too, for joining us and staying with us. Charlene, thank you so much. Uh, hey, Charlene. Charlene is one of our uh, grad students here from Kenya. They're in California. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlene. We are honored. Um, Josephine Mudzingwa says to everyone, 
Uh, I can't see other participants except three people. Um, well, I can assure you that there are more than three of us here. There are eight participants and three panelists. So uh, be assured um, we, we are here. Thanks for being here with us, uh, Josephine. Thank you, Josephine. It's the beauty of technology, Josephine. If we if we had a Zoom meeting, we would see everybody. But uh, webinar lets us cheat a little bit, so <laughs> it gives it gives a bit more discretion. So you're not under pressure to to show yourselves and, and speak to us. But we appreciate that everyone stayed the course with us, and it's been an excellent conversation. Wow, I've got I'm the first black counselor in 48 years. Where, Josephine? Which Where is NTC? I'll probably allow you to speak, Josephine. Are you happy to do that? I'll, I'll let you speak. Here, we'll add you to the conversation. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hello, how are you? Um, am I? We can hear you fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm in England. Um, I'm in a place called um, North Tyneside, um, next to Newcastle. Okay. And uh, yeah, well, we're trying to follow Martin Luther's dream, uh, which is actually taking so long because it has been 48 years to have a first black councillor. I got elected in May, on the, on the 5th of May, and I'm the only black person in the chamber. Um, it's um, lonely, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but the racism, and this side is worse than the one in America because people in America, if they don't like you, they will tell you that they don't like you. At least you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything is um, is uh, is covered right under the carpet. I um, I was rejected seven times before I uh, actually got. Um, uh, got to be elected, uh, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't even the people who are outside, but the people who are inside. Um, they kind of like they will, they will try by all means to make sure that you cannot become a candidate, and um, I I felt that I was a slave in a way, because uh, the interview was um, asking me, how do you solve a problem in um, in medieval area? Then you can tell them all the answers, all the answers, everything. Um, I would plan like this, I would invite tourists, I will do this, I will do this. Um, on crime level, I will do that, I will do that. They, then they will invite their other, to reject you as a group. And then you go to the next ward, then you do all the research. <laughs> and after when I was um, when I when I was fed up, I really didn't care. That is the one that the, the one the, the one word after I failed, I filed for racism. And then after I filed the racism, they expelled the person. She was a white lady who was actually seconding my uh, my claim of racism because I um, I went to a ward where they were uh, there was zero candidates competing and I was the only candidate. It was in the middle of nowhere, but uh, my advisors they just said, Josephine, it doesn't matter. Just go for it, even if it's far away in the middle of nowhere. What we need to do is you just need to be a counselor. It doesn't matter whether they are people or not people, you can still be a counselor there. We need a first black counselor. So I went there and the people who were interviewing, um, they were just three of that branch. 
and then there was um, the chairperson and uh, an observer. And then the chairperson who actually said, oh, Josephine, your interview was fantastic. And they said they were not gonna take me because they didn't have a choice. Uh, they needed more people to come to be interviewed. Uh, so I filed for racism. And then they, and then uh, before I know it, I'm thinking head office is going to reply me, blah, blah, blah. Then they, they fired the lady who actually had actually been supporting my case, which means my case was just useless. I couldn't have a witness. And, and then finally, my last word, um, karma just beat them really good because I beat a sitting councillor who was a cabinet member and all the seats were finished. <laughs> so he didn't have any way to become a councillor or cabinet member. That's how God works. That's my story for today. Well, talk about disarmament, Josephine. I think you've <laughs> taken disarmament to the next level. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> And I think because, because you're not too far away, by all means, do stay in touch. You know, where are you? Where, where, where are you guys? I'm, I was just invited. Somebody just told me, like, we are in a, we, we say no to racism WhatsApp group. So the guy just said, just log in, just log in. So we were like, ah, it's almost finished. We are not going to log in. Okay. But thank you for logging in because I think here in Northern Ireland, I think we only have one black counselor, a female from Kenya. Um, the other counselor is Zimbabwean also, but she's white. So it, uh, in a way, it, it doesn't count for the purpose of what we're trying to do because she can blend in quite easily as opposed to us. It's very visibly obvious that we're not white, of course. So um, you don't have to feel that you're alone. We're not too far away. If you're in mainland UK, we're literally 55 minutes, no more than an hour to get to where we are. And let's keep the lines of communication open. There's strength in numbers. And I believe this meeting is, is just the beginning of these minds, as the professor said, being reconstructed and the members of the body being reconstituted, essentially. So we're good to go, I think. Please, please follow our social media for Axoni. Join her as well as the professor to keep abreast of different um, developments within our cultural and academic space, um, so we can keep uh, so we can keep doing this job, keep fighting the good fight. Um, professor, once again, our our, our deep gratitude to you uh, for giving us your time. Um, and to all the participants, thank you so much. To you, Laurie, thank you as well for helping us to, to, to host this event. And I'm looking forward to hosting many more, not only uh, digital events, but the physical events. So let, let's keep on fighting. And Josephine, just in response to your last question, yes, we can, uh, we, we can come to your party and you can come to ours too. So. They strengthen numbers. Yes, there is. So I think onwards and upwards, the Chimurenga has the Chimurenga war has begun. So here we are. Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye.